In this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the ISA practical skills and the assessment criteria that are used in specifically the practical part of the exam. I'll make subsequent videos for the theory paper. So the first thing that is assessed is the table of data which you've collected. Now, I've used a table of data from an ISO where you're trying to work out the resistance of a resistor using a VI curve, but obviously this applies equally to any other ISO, which you do, but you may need more or fewer columns depending. So let's have a look at <coughs> some of the key things that you need to include. Now the first thing I want to draw your attention to is this box here at the bottom. Now in this box I've recorded the precision of the measuring instruments that I'm using. Now the reason you need to do this is that one of the assessment criteria is that you've recorded all your data to an appropriate precision for the measuring device. And the only way an examiner can know that it's, you've used the appropriate one is that you've actually recorded it down there and you've recorded it correctly. So you see here on the voltmeters, typically, you can measure down to 0 0.010 volts, so that's the precision of it. So then if we look at this potential difference column on the left, you'll see all of those have two decimal places as well, just like the precision. So the examiner can see that and go, yes, they've recorded all their data to the correct precision. Same with the ammeter. If you're using the milliamp scale, typically you can go to 0.1 of a milliamp, so then if you look down the columns here, there's three of them for the current, you can see they're all recorded to one decimal place as well. So they're all recorded to the same precision as the instrument. That's the first thing. So the next thing is these column headings here at the top. And as we can see on the left, you should always include the units in your column. So you shouldn't see units inside the table with each piece of data. They should be at the top and they should have a separator. So if we look at this one for potential difference, the separator I've used is this forward slash here, and then you record the units afterwards. And you could equally decide, wait, I'm gonna put it in brackets instead. That's equally valid, but you need a separator to actually show the unit for the different units. So in, in the other ones, you would get in brackets A as well. So that works as well. Let's move on to the next one. So looking down your column here, the examiner should be able to see seven rows of data. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which makes it a valid experiment. So you need to show that you've changed the independent variable seven times. Okay, so looking at your table here, we've got the independent variable here, the potential difference on the left, and we've got our dependent variable here in these three columns. And what the examiner is looking for is an indication that repeat readings have been taken. So we've taken measurements of the current three times here, so there's clear repeats. And then looking at the final column, that an average value of the repeat readings has been calculated. And if you see here in this column, the averages have one more decimal place in them, which is an important thing that you should see in any table that you're producing as well as otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the benefit of taking the average in very many cases without that extra decimal place. So that's the keys in designing a table. Let's move on to drawing a graph. So again, there are some key points that need to be indicated here. So let's start uh, from the top. So if you can see here on your axis, we've got the separator again and the unit on both axes. So just like in the table, you need to have the unit on the axes or you end up getting a point taken off. If you're using a piece of graph paper, your graph itself should occupy over half of the graph paper. Otherwise, if it's not, you're not giving as much detail as you could do. So it should be over half the graph paper. If we look at the scales on these axes here, you can see on this graph it goes up in 20s on the y-axis and 2s on the x-axis. That's a perfectly valid way to go up. 
What isn't a perfectly fair way to go up is in threes or sixes or sevens, that type of thing. It needs to be in point ones, point twos, point fives, ones, twos, fives, tens, twenties, etc. So a unit that makes it easy to work out what these sub-levels are down here. Because if that was, say, 3 instead of 20, then these sub-levels would be a annoying long decimals. They wouldn't be easy numbers to read off. So you should see the independent variable, which in the case of the experiment was the potential difference on the x-axis, and the independent variable on the y-axis, which in this case was the current. And make sure you're plotting the average you've calculated, not one of your sets of readings. Just to bring your attention, typically, uh, when I look talk about this one, about points being marked with an X, typically in the examiner will check two of your points to make sure they're within one millimeter of the point you're trying to plot. And if they're not, then you end up losing a mark. So you need to be very careful with plotting your data, making sure that it is in the correct place. And if we look at this line of best fit here, these points are all generated on a computer, so they landed up very nicely on a best fit line. But in the case of your best fit lines, they won't all end up on the line. And you should try and get roughly half above and half the points below or on the line. But making sure, say you had a piece of anomalous data up here, this should not affect the line of best fit in any way. So don't count it as in the half above or below. Just put a circle around it and mark it as an outlier and then probably retake that result to see if you get a better piece of data from it. So that is a graph. So I just want to bring to your attention a couple of clarifications on what to do with questions. So one of the typical instructions in this type of experiment is it, you'll get in the instruction change the potential difference from 1 volt to 4 volts and measure the current. Now the thing that you need to remember is you're trying to get 7 readings. Or actually what? Well, 7 plus readings. So when it gives you a specific range like this, that means it's expecting you to take a result uh, at 1 volt and 4 volts or close to them, like they're not expecting you to get exactly one for other words, but you are looking to get as close as you can to those values. And then, and then you're looking for five readings between, and obviously you don't want to have all of those at like 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and they should be spaced out. So it's quite simple but something that people do get wrong and that they'll have all of their readings between 1 and 2 volts or between 3 and 4. You need to make sure you have 1 at 1 volt, 1 at 4 volts and then 5 spaced out between. They don't need to be equally spaced out. Don't worry about trying to go up in specific amounts but just make sure you've got uh, some sets of data from throughout the range. If they don't specify a range then that leaves it up to you to decide what your range will be. Bearing in mind the equipment that you're using. So maybe the resistors can't take more than a certain value of potential difference, for instance. But that's a special type of question that does come up quite a lot and it does tend to trip people up quite a bit. And the other thing that really tends to trip people up is just forgetting to write the precision of their instruments and it costs them a mark. And on this practical section of the ISO, you really should be getting all all the marks. They're quite easy to pick up. You just have to have the attention to detail to make sure you've included everything you need 